The New Testament reading today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. It can be found on the New Te- in the New Testament on page 198. Even though I, Paul, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to thank Nancy Hamadou for doing such a beautiful job reading for us this morning. Thank you, Nancy. Will be appreciated. While most of the focus in medicine in regards to COVID 19 remains on clearing the patient of the virus, I think it is likely that by this time next year there will be a new focus on those who have survived the infection and are struggling with an associated medical issue, post-COVID disease, which is a real thing in a number of people who've had the virus. There seems to remain this massive blind spot in the politics and the reporting of the pandemic that only acknowledges two outcomes for those who are infected, death, recovery. But many who have survived the ravages of COVID-19 find themselves still disabled or chronically ill long after they have tested negative. And the jury is still out as to how long what has been labeled as post-COVID syndrome will last. We just don't know right As research facilities and epidemiologists continue their work with COVID survivors, they are discovering that many are suffering from chronic fatigue-like symptoms, including a severely limited lung capacity. This inability to breathe is not due so much to what the active virus does to the lungs of the patient when the active virus is there, but what COVID leaves behind after it has been cured. The medical term for this debris, which remains in the scarred lungs, is ground glass opacities, which creates a permanent condition of pulmonary fibrosis. The debris in the lungs left by the virus creates scarring 
for which there is yet a cure, forcing many older patients, and even some younger, into a state of permanent disability. It appears that at least in some patients, in fact, maybe quite a number of them, COVID-19 leaves tracks from its presence. Apart from the medical consequences of viral debris, there are other places in life where debris can be almost as hazardous as that which created the debris. We are still learning this, aren't we, after 9-11. Nine years after that terrible day, those who remain to clean up the debris are still suffering from various conditions associated with rubble from the two towers. I said nine years. It's 19 years. 19 years. Cancer, respiratory illness, and a host of other disorders have killed or disabled not only many of the first responders who sifted through the rubble, but the construction workers and the demolition crews who spent nine months cleaning the 1.8 million tons of toxic debris. Even residents of the city who were simply unfortunate enough to breathe in the cloud of dust that day have suffered permanent and in some cases fatal results. In our scripture lesson from this morning, the Apostle Paul identifies an equally toxic debris that in his view nearly destroyed his life and his soul. Paul talks about this spiritual debris in his letter to his fellow Christians in Philippi. Last week in my message, I described the situation in this congregation, a congregation that was so beloved by Paul, a congregation that Paul held in his heart. Certain Jewish-centered Christian preachers, Jewish-centered Christian preachers, were traveling through Asia Minor and the Roman Empire, calling for Christians, many of whom had been part of the temple worship in Jerusalem or in other places, to return to the legalistic practices of their former religion. These itinerant preachers were preaching a kind of hybrid Christianity or religion combining the messianic worship of Jesus with the dietary and discriminatory laws of traditional first century Judaism. In addressing the dangerous divisions that are beginning to divide the congregation, Paul points to his own bona fides when it comes to having been not only a faithful adherent to Israel's laws, but a self-described Hebrew born of Hebrews. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of Christianity as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In these words, Paul is asserting his spiritual authority over Judaizers, and that's what they were called, those in the Christian church who were trying to bring Christianity more back toward Judaism, the Judaizers, who are trying to steer the fledgling Christian church back into a legalistic religion of rules and hierarchy and fear. Now, what was the motive of these advocates in calling for this change 
in the life of the Christian church? Well, they actually had pretty good motives. There are probably a number of them. But some of them attack the very spiritual essence of freedom and of faith in Jesus Christ. We know that many of the Judaizers were uncomfortable with the diversity of Christianity, a faith which included women, slaves, Gentiles, former pagans, Roman officials, tax collectors, the poor, the sick, in fact, anyone who believed in Jesus as the Son of God. Such worship had never existed. Before Christianity. These Judaizers also feared the local synagogue and its leadership. While the oppression of the synagogue against the church was not an issue in Philippi, the church to which Paul is writing, because it had no synagogue in the city, but it was a major source of persecution at that time against Christianity. In Christianity, by this time, there were churches in many cities. So this led people within the Christian community. And we can understand how they felt, can't we? That led to them to call for compromise or even to partially return to synagogue participation. These folks didn't want to lose the way of feeding their families. They didn't want to be ostracized or isolated by their communities or their own families. They did not want to be outside of the law of the local Roman jurisdiction. So we can certainly understand why they did this. But Paul reminds the Philippians that in embracing Christ as the Son of God and their Savior, their old religion was supplanted by a living relationship with God, one which is so, so meaningful, so fulfilling, that it turns, according to Paul himself, all other beliefs into debris. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings. Paul's detractors in Philippi are preaching a return to a knowledge of religious law as the central thing of that which defines God. Paul counters that idea with his experience of knowing the living Christ in Christ's death upon the cross and his resurrection to eternal life, a realization of a God who loves, who forgives, who guides, and who saves. In comparison to that kind of relationship with God, Paul declares that anything else, any other approach to God, is nothing more than spiritual debris, a toxic waste that enslaves the soul rather than frees it, that divides rather than unites that ends in death rather than life, leaving us trapped 
in the broken kingdoms of a fallen world rather than in partnership with Christ in the kingdom of God. Paul celebrates this. He rejoices in it. And Paul has lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost the religion of his birth and that which he grew up with. He's lost his authority in the communities that he lived. He's lost everything. But he counts all of that as gain in coming to know Christ. Christian author Max Lucado, who in my view is restating Paul's message to the Philippians, wrote these words. We are Jesus Christ's. We belong to him. But even more, we are increasingly him. He moves in and commandeers our hands and feet, requisitions our minds and tongues. We sense his rearranging, debris into the divine, pig's ears into silk purses. He repurposes bad decisions and squalid choices. And little by little, a new image emerges. This morning on this World Communion Sunday, we gather with believers of every tribe and every tongue to clear out the spiritual debris of our hearts. The doubt, the despair, the disobedience, the apathy, the pessimism, all these things. And in so doing, to re-image our lives into the cruciform life of Jesus Christ. This meal remakes and refreshes us. This meal renews our relationship with the Holy Spirit and clears the detritus of dogma and cheap grace. The bread and body of Christ make a new, uncluttered space in our lives whereupon we can build the ministry to which Jesus has called us. And we can bring the kingdom of God into a world that wants it. No longer tripped up by the debris in our hearts, we can heal the damage in the lives of those around us the chronic suffering of the unforgiven, the impoverished, the marginalized, those who feel spiritually abandoned, and many others can be healed by the simple acts of Christian love that we share with them each and every day. Food for the hungry, prayer for the wounded, comfort for the grieving, and hope for the lonely and dis disjointed lives of those for whom Jesus himself died. This table is the place where we unclutter ourselves from the debris of our own failures cause all of us fail and all of us fall. This table is where with clear eyes and unswerving purpose we follow our Lord to where he needs us to be. Is that why we have come this morning? To take out the garbage and bring in the treasured and precious love of Jesus Christ. Because frankly, there is no other reason to be here at this table sharing our Lord's body and blood.